the engine started to rev up and I was looking into the eyes of my friend Anna and I just saw sheer terror uh, looking back at me. So I thought, this is it, I'm going to die. All right, welcome back to Max Out, everybody. Today's show is special. It's unique. Um, I have a very unique man with me today that I sought out after reading his book, Shine On. And what we're going to talk about today, everybody, is death and life after death. And I know that that's a topic that we think of even more than we realize we think of. It's something that every human being is fascinated with. And you all know that I have, and before we do this, I know many of you come to the show today with you know, very deeply held religious beliefs, including myself. And today is not in any way to change those beliefs. It's just to give you the insight into David's story and, uh, and to see what insights and breakthroughs that it might give you uh, that might even strengthen your current faith. So um, my guest today is David Ditchfield. And David, welcome to Max Out. Thanks, Ed. It's great to be here. I'm curious. Uh, it's so great to have you because I've read the book. Um, who were you before this? So who was uh, David Ditchfield before he ends up getting dragged by a train, which you'll all hear about in a minute. That's a teaser for <laughs> one of the most amazing stories you're ever going to hear in your life. But who were you before that? Okay. Well, uh, I'd, I'd basically, I'd left school without any qualifications cause I'm dyslexic. And, uh, so I moved to London and I was just hoping to sort of just like cut my, my way through life there. And, um, I mainly I was picking up uh, blue collar work. So I was doing working on construction sites and, uh, you know, day to day sort of manual working, um, living in London, obviously like all capital cities is very competitive, expensive place to live. So, you know, time got tough for me to say the least. Um, and I didn't really, do you know what I was doing? I was doing all these manual jobs and I didn't really fit in. I didn't, I'm not, I didn't fit in. I couldn't do them as well. I used to look at these guys, <laughs> plastering a ceiling and I say wow that's the work of art how'd you do that you know <laughs> so <laughs> so life just felt like it was the gears were grinding all the time so so yeah so did you grow up with any religious beliefs in particular before this experience did you believe in God didn't believe in God or did you subscribe to a particular faith I, I didn't actually know um interestingly enough my parents are both Christian so uh, you know they, they used to take us all to church as a family and I rejected the idea I didn't feel comfortable with with church you know I wasn't an atheist but I just didn't like the whole idea of church I've got nothing against any faiths but that's right. where I was as a kid you know so my parents were really liberal and they said that's cool you can you know stay at home so mm -hmm. I kind of faith and all religion kind of went out of my life really yeah Okay. And um, that, that's interesting to me because I'm going to be interested in your take post this experience. So take everybody through, look, all of us have defining moments in our lives. They can be big and small, right? Uh, um, you know, a defining moment can just be meeting somebody. A defining moment can be leaving a career and starting a business. It could be deciding you're going to lose a bunch of weight. You, my friend, had a real defining moment in one's life uh, to the extreme. And it's one that most of us dream of, maybe even have nightmares about fantasize about, wonder about, you got to experience something that very few people that come back uh, ever have a chance to experience. So take us through what happened first and then the experience sure. post, if you would. Of course, yeah. Um, basically, I, I was seeing a friend off at the rail station uh, in, in Cambridge and um, I was helping her onto the train with her bags and stuff, you know, and I gave her a kiss and a hug goodbye, you know, and probably didn't leave quick enough because we heard the, the emergency buzzers going and as I stepped back the bottom part of my coat it was like a thick sheepskin coat got trapped in the closing doors as I slammed to now I couldn't pull it out I tugged as hard as I could you know I, I yelled at the top of my voice for help hoping that a go. guard would, would turn up but nobody did <laughs> um so yeah you know emergency bu buttons on the side I whacked those they didn't work so I the, the the engine started to rev up and I was looking into the eyes of my friend Anna and I just saw sheer terror uh, looking back at me. So I thought, this is it, I'm going to die, you know, because the engines were just ready to go. And um, the train pulled out and it pulled out at tremendous speed. I heard every gear shifting, you know, and I, I lost my footing eventually. I got dragged along the platform and then I got sucked between the, the edge of the platform and the, the speeding train itself. And down I went, you know, and uh, it's really strange because um, 
it's like time had, uh, had stretched because I, I remember as I went down, I remember seeing the sides of the carriage almost disappear into the sky and I heard this tremendous rip. And then down I went and I was just pulled down into the, it, like, into the gates of hell. It was into this dark sort of aggressive machine and I was just tossed around relentlessly like a ragdoll. And um, I was fully conscious throughout the whole ordeal. Um, but I was thrown eventually down to the ground in between the tracks as the train was still continuing on at fast speed above my head. So I just mm. kept my face down into the gravel um, because I knew it wasn't all over yet. I thought part of the undercarriage could just whack me over the back of the head and that would be it. So um, it's interesting because I, I, was, I was in survival mode basically. And so I suddenly thought to myself, remember the James Bond films, the 007, you know, all those adventure films, what he would do now he would just put his head down and keep it and lay flat. So that's what I did. You literally um, had that conscious thought that James Bond in that moment, really? I did do, yeah. I, I thought of lots of things. You know, actually, just as, as the train was about to leave, I suddenly had this thought came into my head. I'd seen a news uh, article about two or three weeks earlier where a small child had been thrown from a burning apartment block from the, the second or third floor and had landed uh, without any uh, injuries. And they said that's because children, infants, uh, don't tense up as we do as adults, and they, they just kind of relaxed. So I relaxed my whole body as I, as I was dragged and pulled under. So, you know. Wow. Did you feel physical pain? Could you, were you experiencing physical pain at the time? Um, I was, but it's, it's interesting. It's like, I thought about it when I, was, when I was at school, when I was a kid, I remember having my first fight in the playground, you know, and I remember the first punch really hurt. Then the ones after that didn't, didn't hurt so much. So it was a <laughs> bit like that, if you like. It was very painful, but you kind of like went to, into this kind of like, sort of like, well, it's happening and it's happening so quick that you didn't really have time to absorb, you know, the full entity of, of the pain until the train had moved on. And then I felt it, you know big time you know I was the train there. actually physically dragged you though correct you were dragged yeah. by the train that's right yeah because my coat was still trapped in in the doors and it was only the sheer force of me being pulled between the the, the platform edge and the speeding train itself that released me and then then and pulled me right under you know so, so when we die did you have a moment before this and i'll let you please elaborate don't feel like you need to be brief um but did you have a thought i'm i'm dying right now did that yeah. happen prior? And what goes through one's mind in those final seconds, if anything? Um, interestingly enough, it, it was terrifying, but nowhere near as terrifying, terrifying as, um, as the, anticip the anticipation, if you like. You know, if, if, I, if somebody said to me like two minutes before, you're going to get pulled along by this train and you're going to get pulled under, I would have just freaked out. But when it actually happened, I, I dealt with it. You know, my mind went into survival mode rather than, you know, uh, what's it called, you know, flight or fight. So yeah. I went into fight mode and decided that, that I was going to, I was going to beat this thing. It was, it was odd. It felt like the, this speeding train suddenly turned into this like big mechanical monster. And I felt like it was just me against this huge machine. Um, mm. Yeah. Okay. When I got pulled under, I did, I was aware. I suddenly felt like I'm just flesh and bones and this is a huge chunk of, of metal going at high speed that's probably going to kill me but as i say i just kept fighting and i just kept my head together as much as i possibly could and uh, is there a point david where you have a thought and then you're no longer in thought what took place do you do you vividly remember the moment yeah. when you i guess did die or do you not remember that when it happens Oh, right. Well, I, I didn't actually die at the, uh, when I went under the train. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I survived it and then, then they took me into hospital, but yes. you know, clearly I was very near to death, but um, it's, it's interesting because I, I saw a documentary with, with, with a, a guy, a US doctor called uh, David Eagleman uh, recently. And he was talking about this and he said that it often happens that when people are facing death like me and they're in danger, that the mind kind of like sort of, it, it, the, the, the conscious mind sort of leaves and, and, and you're able to just go into the state of, like I was of thinking it through. Like, for example, it took the, the rail police timed it on. And I said, how long did it take before the moment I got pulled up and then pulled under? And they said 13 and a half seconds. And to me, it felt like minutes, like time was stretched out. 
but it was like I, got, I could see everything as well. I took everything in, like, a, like I got this 35 mil widescreen that suddenly camera being fitted to me, you know, and, and that, is, that is quite regular. That happens to people. I was probably uh, moving you forward a little bit, and I don't want to make sure that I do that, but I'm referring to the moment in the hospital when yeah. you, and by the way, if I miss something significant there, go back, because I don't want anybody to no, miss anything, good. but I'm sort of thinking you, the train incident has taken place. You're now at the hospital. I'm wondering in that moment, and please fill in the blanks in between, is there something, is there a thought that you now know you've slipped to the other side or through the veil or was there a conscious thought this was happening? If you would take us through all of those, that, that sure. moment in the hospital, if there's anything prior to that, please fill it in as well though. No, that's fine. Um, I mean, basically they got, they got me off the rail tracks somehow and into an ambulance and I was in, in the uh, emergency department and I was losing copious amounts of blood at this point. And the doctors were frantically running around and I was, I thought this is it. You know, I'm scared that I'm still going to go because they sounded scared. And I went from that high anxiety and the sheer pain that I was in to suddenly I slipped into another place altogether. And uh, the moment of transition was, was quick, but it was very, it was, it was very calm. And I was suddenly in what I felt was like a darkened room. And uh, when I say dark, it wasn't in a, a foreboding dark. It was actually a very comfort, comfortable place. And I, I kind of looked around me to see what was going on. And when I looked around, I saw like these beautiful orbs of colors that were like slowly pulsating all around me. And it kept me calm. You know, I felt very relaxed, but I figured at that point that I had died. I thought, right, I didn't make it. This is it. This is the other side, you know. And um, I didn't fight it. I didn't resist it. It's not like I wanted to die. Uh, you know, I wanted to live. But I was so comfortable with where I was after the extreme horror that I'd just been through that I just kind of went with it. So I kind of got my bearings as you would do. And I looked around and I realized that I was no longer laid on the hospital trolley, but I was on a huge rock. It was like a big sort of medieval altar, if you like. And uh, it was made of slate. And I felt very comfortable on, on lying on this slate, which is odd because you wouldn't do normally. And I realized I was no longer clothed, but I was, I was covered in a blue sort of satin sort of sheet, which was very comfortable, really cooling. And, um, I laid my head back and I just kind of went with the flow. And then as I looked up, there were like these three grids of white lights slowly closed in on me. And as I looked up into this light, I couldn't take my gaze away because the, the purity of this light was just so wonderful. And it was like, I felt like it was healing me as well. And it was so bright that I wouldn't be able to look into it, you know, if it was electric or, or sunlight normally, but I, I just couldn't take my gaze away. So as I lay there looking into this light, I um, I was there, and then for some time, I suddenly felt the presence of somebody w had arrived. There was somebody with me, so I, I lifted my head, and there was, and there was this person stood just at my feet, uh, like a, an androgynous being, you know, like neither male nor female, with this pure white blonde hair, and this skin that was glowing from within it was like this light coming from this being, and and it, it was interesting because he or she was just wearing like a very contemporary black t-shirt like you and I would be wearing you know and, and nothing too ethereal at all and I felt like I knew I'd known this being for a long you know I thought who are you I know you don't I I just knew I just knew that face but I, I don't know why but it but I did and he or she just kept smiling back at me and I felt like I was safe and I was being protected uh, by this being so I you know I just laid my head back again and I just kind of figured um this is really, quite, this is really, really lovely. This is amazing. And uh, then I felt the presence of, uh, that there was other people around me. And so I looked and there was, there was either side of me, there was two female forms. Um, uh, again, there was the girl to my right was very con wearing a good just a contemporary brown dress, long brown hair, kind of European looking. And the girl to my, to my left was, was more uh, American Indian or Asian Indian appearance. And um uh, wearing like a more of a traditional dress and they had their hands just kind of like slowly hovering over my body almost like sort of reiki healing or something like that you know and the energy that was coming from their hands was just so powerful they didn't touch me but they just kind of hovered over and um, to me it felt like they were healing my soul you know they weren't just healing the, the wounds to my body because interestingly enough I checked 
my wounds because my left arm had been severed in the accident uh, from the elbow down. But as I looked, everything was back in place. Everything was fixed, not even a scratch, you know. So, so I realized that this healing that was going on was just kind of like healing all, all the, you know, all the kind of past wounds in my life. It was all that gone because, because like I said to you before, I, before I didn't feel like I fitted in anywhere in life and I felt like I was struggling. So I felt like a failure basically. But in this place and in this space, I, I didn't feel any of those feelings. Everything like that had gone, you know, all, all feelings of guilt or, or what have you, had completely dispersed. <laughs> so, so, I want to stay with you. I want to interject. What's interesting to me is what you're not feeling to some extent, meaning yeah. it sounds to me as if it's not occurred to you that you have left Earth and have died, and that uh, would be a scary and sad thing. It occurs to me you're not thinking of, at least at this moment yet, missing friends or family or situations um, uh, or really even wanting to process everything that's going on that it seems like it's so beautiful and joyous that you're just sort of enjoying it and that override any things I would think logically you would be thinking about in that moment. True or false? Absolutely true, yeah. yeah. And Which is very unlike me uh, up until that point because I was a very conscientious person and I was, uh, and I carried a lot of guilt and I always felt like I was the one who was messing up in the family. You know, I remember cause my parents, my family had arrived in, in the, in the hospital just before I'd left my body and my mother was in tears, you know, and, uh, I was going, mom, I was, I was apologizing back in the hospital saying, mom, it's always me bringing all these dramas and troubles to the family. I'm so sorry. And she said, it's not your fault, which of course it wasn't. But when I was in this space and in this place, all that had gone. I remember actually thinking about my family. Yeah. I thought, ah, I better check on my family because they're going to be pretty cut up now because clearly I'm dead. You know? <laughs> and so, mm. But it wasn't like a sort of like a sort of, Oh my goodness, my family, you know, it wasn't that kind of response. It was like a very calm sort of, right. So I tried to look over the edge of this huge rock that I was on, hoping to see them. And as I did look down, uh, I, I couldn't see them at all. But what I saw was this amazing sight. It was this beautiful, it's like a huge waterfall of stars. that was like, that curved around, you know, the size of Niagara or what have you. But it was just, instead of water cascading over the edge, it was just millions of stars just sparkling and just, it was a beautiful sight. And I just thought, wow, this is awesome. I'm not in a small darkened room at all. I'm actually in the universe itself, you know. And so I looked up and there were stars all around and I just thought, and I saw shooting stars falling through the middle of this. And I looked down to see how far I could see. And I saw what looked like one galaxy then disappearing into another. Then I could see it was like an abyss and then into this, into different colors, into different galaxies. And um, so by now I'm just kind of like feeling this is just amazing, you know, <laughs> and uh, I, um, I turned over and this was the moment of, of, um, of well, truth, I guess, where I, I did, when I turned over, I felt this energy of, uh, that I was feeling. When I talked about this energy that was coming from the, the hands of the healers, it was like an en energy of love, you know. And this suddenly that energy had been turned up like a dial. And what had happened was I looked and there was a, a huge tunnel of white light that was closing in on me. And um, this tunnel of white light was just surrounded by dramatic flames that were slowly rotating around. And again, I felt no fear. I just felt excitement because it looked, looked so awesome. And um, the energy that was coming from this white light was just so powerful that it, I felt like every molecule of my body was, was almost like vibrating with this feeling of love that was coming. And when I talk about this love, it's like, it was like all the different expressions I'd love I've, I'd had in my life, whether it's through my, my parents, my siblings or my lovers or even my pet cat you know it was all those different types of love condensed into one and uh, it was just like it's beautiful and i just knew at this point that what i was staring at was the, the source of all creation you know this was this was god it's actually this tunnel of white light and that's that's that was it the source of all creation that i was now looking right at are there times where you look back on this event and wonder what was this um, could I have been under, you know, severe medication and anesthesia and I'm sort of transcending these two places and the, the, these are the people that were working on me. I'm wondering if those thoughts have occurred to you post as you've reviewed this scene millions of times probably in your mind. 
it's never occurred to me and that's the truth you know it, as far as i'm concerned it happened and and it's it wasn't there's a difference between a, a hallucination and a, and a dream dream state and hallucinations are more chaotic and 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 bizarre and and they're also prone to change as well you know it's like mm -hmm. if, you, if you have a dream you know you, it, after a bit if you forget it or your or the boundaries shift whereas with a near-death experience you know it stays with you because it's it's ultra real you know it's it's as real as i'm sat here now you know chatting with you and it's um you know so you can't you can't really escape it personally when you've had a near-death experience of course I'm, I'm fully aware that I've been, you know, questioned before that, you know, the, the scientific the take on it, which is great because I mean, without science, I wouldn't be here. You know, let's face it. Mm -hmm. you know, the science has saved me, but mm -hmm. you know, um, it's interestingly enough when, when I started writing my book, um, I spoke to a friend of mine who was uh, lecturing in nursing. And I said, look, would you look at my medical records if I get them from the hospital and see what kind of drugs I was on and if they were mind bending at the time. Yep. And so she did. And uh, I was given some medication when I was on the track, which she said could have had an effect. But by the time, judging by all the timing, when I was in the hospital itself in, in the emergency department, before you know, uh, I had my NDE at that point, it wouldn't have been in my system enough to have been hallucinogenic. Uh, okay. if, if at all, if at all, because, uh, you know, it wasn't a strong drug because they were getting me ready to go into theatre. So they had to watch just how much stuff they were putting in my system. Yeah, so, David, so, these beings that were around you, they were human form, though, in your yeah. mind. They were you're, they're human form in your experience. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and um, you said earlier that that light was the source of the universe and it was comforting and beautiful. And I think that gives people great comfort. Then you said but it wasn't this person in the sky or Allah or one of these other things. Um, yeah. One of the things that, have, that is uh, in scriptures that mo multiple different scriptures, but I'm a Christian is that that process between here and heaven and the process in getting there um, is not described or heaven is, but that transition to getting there uh, for mm -hmm. the thousands of words in scriptures is not a highly detailed and documented uh, or described experience. And so I think just for people that have a particular faith, because we're not done yet with the story, but I, I and I hope you would be too. I hope that, that there's an opening that would, could be on the other side of that, that you didn't ultimately end up getting to could be revealed to them in the way that they believe it currently here on earth. Right. So what happens after this comforting uh, light uh, experience that's so beautiful, what takes place next? Well, I don't know. Uh, that is, is the answer to that because with my near-death experience, uh, it wasn't too long after I'd seen the huge yes. tunnel of light, and I gained that knowledge that what I'd seen was what it what it was. That I came mm -hmm. back crashing back to earth. I one thing I felt throughout the whole experience was that I felt like I was being prepared for something. I felt like they were going to send me on somewhere next to, to the next level, the next stage. I didn't mm -hmm. actually feel right. I'm in heaven. You know, I just mm -hmm. felt like I'd reached a beautiful, almost like a departure land, if you like. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I felt I was. So I can't answer that and say what happens next. Some people have, some people go into more detail and go on to, you know, uh, and see different things than I do. Um, yeah. But I felt that I was, they, I would, they'd equip me with enough knowledge to come back and, and say, and basically try my best to get the message over through different forms, creative forms. I started painting and started writing music. and then Beautifully, books, by the so, way. Thank you very Beautifully, much. by the way, when you go to David's website, everybody, beautiful work. And, um, but I want to say something to everybody listening because I just think it's such a beautiful experience that there's some confirmation that people like yourself have experienced in these NDEs that my gosh, there is something after this. And for those of you that hold to a particular faith, I love David's story. It's why I wanted David on above everybody else, because we don't know what happens at the end of that light. Perhaps the things that you strongly believe in your faith is, is where you're going to meet your angels or your family members. Other people have said they've met family members on that other side. You meet your savior, whatever that means to you. But what's most beautiful about this experience is, is that there was something real that took place in this beautiful, comforting place and that there wasn't misery and sadness and these tremendous no. emotions of loss. And then the other, the great news is that there wasn't nothing that it no, didn't just exactly. end. That's it. And yeah, so, that's, so that's I think it's it. so beautiful. And, but, but <laughs> I want to stay with you 
and and thank you by the way too and i think everyone that's watching this you can see david's just he's just a beautiful soul and there's a piece about you that i wish i could have met you prior that i bet i wouldn't experience just in your your energy and in, on your face and et cetera. Oh, you look like a man at peace and um it's okay. So this takes place. And then what, because we know you're back. So, mm, so we right. know you're here talking to us. So what took place from where we left off? Yeah. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I came back uh, crashing back to earth into my body and all the pain came rushing through and all the, 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 the sort of hyperness of the hospital was there. But interestingly enough, a lot of people said, Oh, you must've been disappointed that you came back but I wasn't because I was so charged with all this energy that I had just been given from the other side that I felt connected to it and I just thought why have they sent me back I've, what's my mission you know and uh, so they they rushed me into theater at that point and then I remember I woke up in the, in the middle of the night after eight hours of uh, being operated on and I was just in this room on my own with this little r2d2 machine bleeping and I, all I could think about was what what had just happened and I just thought how am I going to tell the world about this? And I was scared at that point. I was going to forget it all because I knew nothing about near-death experiences. So I, I thought it was just me who'd had it. And I thought, I, I've got to tell the world. And so I decided there and then I'm going to do a painting. And I thought, it's going to be huge. I've never done anything like this before. But I thought, mm. I'm going to do a big, like, Renaissance-style painting like you see uh, Michelangelo's done, you know, these big biblical yeah. scenes, you know. So I thought, that's the way I'm going to tell it. So I decided straight from the off I was going to do that. And... Um, yeah. So once was there a point, it, David, when you were on the other side that you made a conscious choice to come back that you said, I'm coming back or just whoop, you were back? Yeah, no, they, they made that decision for me. <laughs> I, I didn't have any choice in it. You know, so uh, I'm sure who, I'd have been quite who, happy. Who is, who is they? Who made that decision? Well, um, you know, uh, it's it's for me, it's 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 the energy of the, the universe and, and my guides and, and God. Mm hmm also so that that decision was made there um, mm -hmm. uh, it felt like a, a, a you know a group thing it didn't feel like it was just god it felt mm -hmm. like the the because my guides that were there um have worked with me still they, they, they're with me and at that first first being of light that i talked about i feel like that was my soul keeper you know that was like my uh, you know my my high consciousness if you like they made the decision that you're back was there a point when you were, did someone pronounce you dead in the hospital at one point? Did, uh, did your heart stop? What do you think caused you to go to that other side? Yeah, um, I didn't actually die clinically. Um, some people do, but, um, you know, obviously I've looked into near-death experiences a lot now. And, sure. and it's, it's, just, it, it's a case of um, when you're actually very close to it, when you're facing death, you know, like I, I was losing so much blood at that point, you know, that I was in danger of, of just going. So, um, yeah, so they didn't actually pronounce me dead, but, um, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing that I, that I survived basically. So you, you end up, you come back, you make the, the painting, you start, you know, sort of expressing yourself this way. I'm sure mm -hmm. that when you tell a story like this, that, um, you have, tons of support where people are like, thank you for having the courage to share this. Thank you for changing my life. And then I'll bet on the other side, you have people going, why should I believe you? Right. And what would yeah. you say to somebody listening to this? There's a, there's several million people will hear this today and yeah. they want to believe you. Sure. And by the way, there's hundreds of NDEs that are out there. The reason I chose David's was one, the way that he expresses himself. I think he does it in the most respectful way. And I like that there's some mystery left to it that allows people to continue to hold on to um, beliefs that they uh, or knowledge, faith that they have to be held dear to themselves, including somebody like myself, um, because of when it stopped. That's my favorite part of this is that there's still some requisite of faith and, and frankly, mystery to some of this that allows us to um, hold on to things that we, we hold to be true. So what would you say to somebody who just says, you know, you were a guy who hadn't found his way in life and this is your way now of finding significance in your life. You would say what to somebody who asks you that? Well, I'd say that, um, you know, the, 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 the absolute contrast in my life from where I was at before and where I'm at now is just like quite a, a remarkable change, you know? Um, 
you know, writing, doing the paintings is one thing, but write, writing classical music with no formal training at all to this day, and, and I can't even read or write any, a single note of notation, Amazing. but I'm writing for orchestras, you know, which even pe- conductors of orchestras are, 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 and these top guys turn around and say, I would never be able to do what you're doing. It's How did crazy. you do it? You know, so it is crazy. So I was given the, the, you know, this energy to be able to do this. So that's one thing, but, um, you know, it's like, all I want to do is, you know, is, is say to people that, you know, I just want, we never, we don't really talk about death in Western civilization, do we? You know, it, we haven't done mm-hmm. since the days of the, of the plague or what have you, mm-hmm. um, which is, I'm not saying we should be discussing it every day over our morning coffee, yeah. but I mean, we should, we, we, we address everything else, don't we? Like birth and marriage and yes. even taking our driving test. So we should at least stop and have a think about what's going to happen because it's going to happen to what, us all at some point. Well, David, I have this philosophy that we don't talk about it. I agree with you completely, yet I believe we're almost in constant thought about it. And the reason I believe that is because I, I have a belief that, you know, our soul is being called in a particular direction all the time. So I yeah. actually believe that people who live what I call consciously or intentional lives, I think is the majority of my audience, they do think about, there's two things they're constantly thinking about that they're unaware of. One is their childhood and one is their death. And those are the things that cause these emotions that we feel so strongly throughout our lives, I think is because we are constantly being called to these places. And to be honest with you, my childhood and my death someday and where I go after this are the most important things in my life you know, including yeah. my family. It's the most important thing. The, yes. the most important thing to anybody driving in their car or on the treadmill or watching this on YouTube right now is what does happen to me someday? Yeah. Who am I? Am I a body or am I a spirit? And so I think these are the most important things. I'm curious. One, it's obviously caused you to live, to express yourself very differently. But what about just your attitudes about life? So, everyday people listening to this right now that struggle with, I've got an electric bill to pay, or I'm in a disagreement with my spouse. I imagine the perspective change has to be dramatic for someone like yourself. And do you ever slip back into being that other guy where, you know, things that shouldn't, that are pretty trivial end up seeming huge to you on a oh, daily yeah, basis? Yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, you know, you, you know, you don't come back superhuman, you know, so you can, you've got all those things that still stick with you, but you know, you do, come back with an, an a knowledge of like well hang on a sec you know when i was in that place as i discussed earlier you know all those feelings of anxiety and guilt are gone so i try to go back and, and remember that um you know in terms of the soul the way that as you beautifully described it and that's great I, I agree with you on that because i i mean that's one of my takes on it all and that is that the soul is far too powerful a thing just to suddenly switch off like a light when we die you know yeah the bodies do the bodies stop and then they decay but i just believe that the soul is so powerful that it continues on and uh you know so it, i mean the other thing is as well is like you know it's when with scientists and what have you the um, that yeah scientists have they're great, but they haven't got all the answers. We're still, we don't, we're only just touching what's the, you know, the knowledge of the universe, for example, itself. And I kind of figure, this is what I always say. And that is, that, um, say for example, love, we never question that, do we? Like scientists are never looking for an answer for that. There's no scientific equation for why we fall in love with another person and they do with us. And, um, but we just let that go. We, we, we accept it. So why not accept, you know, the fact that the, as I just, I'm saying that the soul lives on and, and, you know, it's, um, it's a beautiful thing. If, I, if I've ever done a show where I want people to feel more comforted and blessed in their life and also maybe change your perspective too. Like I assume now, maybe before you were, but I assume you're not afraid to die. No, I'm not at all. Yeah. And so that's quite a big thing to say, isn't it? You know, I'm not going to just come on and say that. So, so uh, no, I don't fear death at all. So it's, it's, How does that change things? I, I, do you ever, do you wake up some mornings? Like, uh, I, don't, I don't know. There's, do you wake up some mornings going, did that happen? Really? Or, or is it just such a part of you now? It's I mean, a part of gee, me, yeah. Is yeah. it really? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, carry on, Ed. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, yeah. I, you answered it. I, I would think that if I went through an experience like that, I would be so happy. I mean, you've basically, for you, answered the biggest question of life. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's a pretty big deal, brother, you know? It, it is a big deal. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you as well, and that is that when I first came back from the whole experience, when uh, I was just so charged with all this love and this energy that all I wanted to do is give this love out to everyone. And, uh, you know, when I was in hospital, my my 
parents, my family and friends saying, they used to come in and say, you're amazing. You know, you've been under a train. You can hardly move. You've got all these wires and tubes, but you've got this energy glowing from you, you know. So I figured, right, and when I get outside, yeah, I just can't wait, you know. But the reality is I was, you know, I came crashing down afterwards because the world is, is a lot tougher than that. You know what I mean? I, I, I had to go into the... Yeah, you know, all sorts of stuff like legalities and things like that. And of course, that's a tough, tough arena in itself. And me coming out, I, I wasn't armed. I wasn't sort of protecting myself at all. You know, so, so yeah, so there was, it was tough at first just to, just to sort of think that you can go through life living off, off the back of this experience. You still have stress, you still have problems, but there's yeah. greater perspective, it sounds like. Do you have any practices now? that you utilize to uh, enhance your spirituality, your energy, anything like that uh, on a daily basis or, or on a consistent basis? Yeah, I do actually. Um, I discovered um, spiritual healing, uh, which, which I started going to pretty soon after my accident. And that's, and that's great. That's brilliant. I mean, it's like um, not many people seem to know about it or even take part in it because it's, it's, it's almost like, going to meditation or, or Reiki healing, as I discussed earlier, you know, cause it's, it's just kind of hands on, but it, I just feel very connected. I go there for me. That's, I don't just go there now to be healed uh, physically or emotionally. I go there to sort of touch base. If you like, it's like my, my church now. So I go there. Well, at the moment it's not happening because of the pandemic, but up yeah. until that point I was going a lot. And I just used to, for example, like, I'd be sat there and, and the, the, we're, the, it's the building where we do the healing is, is, is in a, like an alleyway that goes down to the river and there's a, there's a boxing gym right opposite. So when you sat there, you go into the <laughs> silence and you hear these guys laying into a punch bag <laughs> and normally you'd be thinking, I can't do this, but do you know what? I just think immediately I start thinking, well, it's, some, it's a young guy who wants to learn to box. You know, that's great. That's his night. This is mine. And I go into that silence to that piece and that, that sound just goes and it just, disappears and it's an amazing feeling and and um i feel connected i feel connected with, with where I, with that other side and i feel the energy through and it's not just me who feels it it's, it's the healers as well who are working with me because they just say i say god you guys are amazing and they say no we're not we're just uh, conducting the energy through and then it goes mm -hmm. into you but they feel it as well do you uh, what's the <laughs> picture behind you of oh. Oh yeah, that's one of my paintings. That is, yeah, that's that's actually an image that I saw when I first started having spiritual healing. I was because mm -hmm. some of the healers, uh, you know, they're clairvoyant and they would just give you like a little message at the end sometimes, you know, just very short. And one week I was being healed and I saw an image of Christ uh, right in front of me while I was being in this healing, you know. And uh, I came through or came whatever you call it afterwards, you know, mm -hmm. we finished, and we just sat there for a bit, and then the healer turned around to me and said, "Oh." You know, you had uh, Jesus was with you, just stuck right by you. I was going, no way. I said, look, I just saw him as well. So, of course, I had to paint him. So <laughs> that's him there. And he's floating above the river, which is right where, yeah. you know, where, where I was. Uh, and I find it there. fascinating that you keep that picture of Jesus uh, very close to you, by the way, as well. I mean, there's looks like there's some family and some other work and then that picture. What did your Christian yeah. parents think of this whole experience? I'm curious. That, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good one because it took me about a week or so to, to tell them because I thought they're not going to get this because I thought it's just going to, you know, it's not going to be part of their teachings or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. in the church. And I wanted them to believe it. So anyway, so when they sat down, it was in the hospital. I said, I've got to tell you something. This, this is something really important. So I talked the whole story through, as I've just told you. And my, my mom just turned around afterwards. She said, we know. And I said, you know, how do you know? She said, David, we come in here and you're just, you, like I said earlier, you've got this light that's glowing from within. You're just glowing with all this beautiful energy. And, and it's like you're giving out this care to everyone around you, including the nurses. And so it's like they got it straight away. So that's, that's lovely. Yeah. So um, it's, it's interesting because I, I said to them, I said, do, do you, does this ever get talked about in church? Does it? And they said, no, it's never really in our faith. It's never really, apart from the resurrection of Christ, you know, it's never really, really discussed. In fact, I spoke to, because we had like a, a there was a, a, a vicar or a priest you know, working in the hospital. And I asked if I could see him. He was one of the first guys that I wanted to tell. And um, it was interesting because he was a lovely guy. But I could see that for him, well, it's like, well, this isn't something that, you know, he's being educated mm -hmm. to sort of, you know, do his role. So 
it was kind of interesting that he couldn't sort of shift. He couldn't go, oh, right, you know. <laughs> he just kind of... it's, 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 yeah, I must tell you, and I know my, some of my Christian followers would say, this is an interesting topic because I don't think David said anything, by the way, that doesn't fit into your faith, by the way, if you're a Christian. I, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't heard anything that doesn't. But one of the things I've always, I'm a detail guy. So as an entrepreneur, I always like, you know, specific details and steps. And so I've talked with at least 30 pastor friends of mine about what do you think the actual process from the moment your light clicks out to when you're in heaven is? And that is an undescribed process. Heaven is described. And some of the transition to there is, and there's a few things you said there today that sound like that. My, my uh, Mormon friends believe in celestial levels of heaven. And so these things in most faiths are um, under-described when compared to the other elements of uh, detail about how to live yeah. our lives better and the works of, of Jesus, for example, in the Christian faith and his teachings. This process is one of the least detailed in description. I know a lot of my listeners say they'll begin to send me descriptions, but I'm talking about in comparison to other things. So this, this entire uh, story fascinates me. And it's extremely interesting to me. Let me ask you this, David, a couple more things. Um, most people that listen to my show, I think, uh, live intentionally, meaning they want to live a better life. It, it, they're not sort of just, you know, unconsciously zombieing through their lives. They feel emotions mm -hmm. deeply. They want to win. They want to dream. They want to achieve. They want to contribute. They want to make a difference. Um, you wouldn't even be listening to something like this. You wouldn't be taking the time. You'd be listening to music only if you weren't one of those types of people. What did, what would you just life lesson overall perspective life lesson about, you know, the time they all have left if they're 20 and they've got 80 years left or they're 60 and they've got 30, whatever it is, what would you just say about what you've discovered about life and its meaning to you and maybe that you would share with them? Um, what I would say is um, be authentic to yourself. Um, Self-love, that's what I learned from the other side. I didn't have that throughout my whole life, you know. And once I'd learned self-love, then I got self-confidence and self-belief. And uh, and then I, I realized it was just whatever I do now is completely authentic to me. It's like my pathway that I'm taking, you know, all st when I started doing the paintings and writing the music, I didn't think, right, um, I'm going to get, you know, I want to get a record deal with this. I want to get it out. To, you know, it, it just, it things started to, doors opened of their own accord because I just focused on on what was there in front of me so you know it's just kind of like being in the moment if you like as well that's another thing is, is just like try and stop and be in the moment and just you know just relax and just focus on what feels right for you don't try to aspire and, and push doors open that don't actually belong to you because that's never going to work out you know I'm just like, curious did you ever have an experience where you saw yourself in the hospital where you looked down and saw you? I didn't do, no, no. Yeah. I, I know that I know there's quite a few accounts where people do, they see themselves, um, mm -hmm. you know, down and, but I, I didn't actually see myself. No. Okay. I'm just curious about that because that is a consistent theme that I've heard with other people that have gone through this. Uh, what I wanted to do today and you've done it brother is I wanted people to just first hear your story and feel your spirit. And I'm hoping that whatever faith you came to this program with today, that it's strengthened that there's some comfort in knowing that something happened after this man's body stopped working and, and it was beautiful and it was so beautiful that he wasn't even feeling the normal emotions of, I better go back. I'm in pain, all of these beautiful things. And so I hope that everybody felt that today and also your wisdom post, you know, coming back about, you know, life and what it really means to be here. And I just think you're wonderful. And uh, if they want, by the way, if they want more of you. It's actually shineonthestory.com. Okay. My so you want to be the yeah. book, shineonthestory.com. Shineonthestory.com, yeah, yeah. Okay. So guys, I recommend you get it. There's a little bit more detail than obviously that we've covered today. And all the way from, what is it, probably 8 o'clock where you are in the UK, right? You're in the UK. Well, yeah, roughly around that now, yeah. <laughs> okay, so so thank you. Uh, doing an evening interview, we're morning here in the United States. So oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. yeah my I, I loved it. Enjoyed it very much today. I let everybody draw their own conclusions, make their own decisions, <laughs> and um, I look forward to talking with you more in the future, David. Everybody else, make sure you follow me on Instagram. We do the max out two minute drill every day on Instagram. I make a post seven thirty Pacific time. If you make a comment on my post in the first couple minutes, or you just comment on every post every day, you're in a drawing to win all kinds of stuff. Max out gear, ride on the plane, tickets to events, you meet my guests, you get coached by me. 
all kinds of cool winners. We pick them every day, every week. So God bless everybody. Max out. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around. If you'd like more, click the videos right here. They're exactly what you need to see next. And if you're new here, hit subscribe and become a part of the Max Out community. And tell me what you think about the videos in the comments below. I read all of them every week, and I select winners that get all kinds of prizes, gear, coaching calls with me. Make a comment.